Do you know where your coffee comes from? Would you care if what you were drinking partly came from poop? Not only do people drink such a thing, they pay top dollar for it. Here's the story of the world's most expensive coffee. Let's go back to the beginning, way back. 1596, the first Dutch traders come to Indonesia, hoping to get in on the lucrative spice trade that was then dominated by Portuguese traders. In 1602, the Dutch East India Company was established, combining rival companies into one corporation. Through the company, the Dutch colonized much of Indonesia, using their hold on the land to expand into other ventures. That, of course, included coffee. The Dutch brought the initial Arabica beans into the country in 1696, exporting its first shipment in 1711. The profitability of the product led to an increased focus in production, one that continues to this day. Indonesia is among the top five coffee producers in the world. However, the process of growing and cultivating the crop, including of course the importation of non-native coffee plants, meant profitability could only come through increased volumes of product. Not only that, the Dutch colonial government enforced a policy called Kulturstressel, the cultivation system. Especially rampant in Java, this system replaced land taxes with forced farming. 20% of a village's land had to be devoted to government crops intended for export. An alternative required peasants to work for the government farm 60 days out of the year. Either way you slice it, they were slaves to Dutch colonizers, unable to roam from their villages without permission, prevented from cultivating enough land to grow their own crops for food, and prohibited from even sampling the very coffee they were forced to grow. The farmers found a way around it, Asian palm civets. Civets are all over South and Southeast Asia, and they've been there since the Pleistocene era. They're solitary, mostly nocturnal, and they won't even come out if the moon is too bright. In fact, little of their behavior has actually been witnessed except for their diet. Mango, palm, flower sap, rambutan, it's all fair game to the civet. In places like Sri Lanka, their constant raids on fruit farms have given them a reputation as pests to be exterminated. Though whatever efforts have been made in that regard, they are still classified as least concerned by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Part of the reason for that is their adaptability to their habitat. Another part is their longevity combined with the expanse of their domain. But some speculate that what's really keeping them alive is their usefulness to the coffee trade. See, among the fruits civets love are the cherries from the Arabica and Robusta coffee plants brought to Indonesia from Ethiopia and Yemen. The civets are a discerning bunch. They leave the unripened fruit alone, preferring to devour the deep red cherries, known for a flavor that's either sweet like watermelon raspberry combo or floral like jasmine. They come out at night, they eat the cherries from the coffee plants, they digest the fruit, and they poop. And in that poop, coffee beans, undigested coffee beans. Beans that were still left whole, so that the enterprising farmer who found them could take them out of the dung, wash them, roast them, and make a cup of coffee from them. This became an Indonesian farmer's secret. It proved to be a good one to have. While painstaking in its collection, the beans yielded a coffee with a one-of-a-kind flavor. First of all, the civet's pickiness meant that only the best beans were being cultivated. Secondly, the digestive process made for a unique filtering system. Proteins that usually affect flavor and aroma were instead broken down in the civet's stomach, while levels of acidity were lowered and the amount of caffeine decreased. The farmers considered the new beverage a better-tasting, better-smelling alternative to the enforced product. They called it Kobe Luwak, literally civet coffee. So what's the actual process? Simple, just go out in the jungle in the after-dawn mist, after the civets have retired, find a pile of their poop studded with coffee beans. Actually, let's be realistic, you want several piles of poo. It could take hours, but it's easy to spot. Again, the beans really do not digest. Collect the piles with the help of a banana leaf or other natural parcel. Bring it back to the farm for proper cleaning. That means pouring the morning's finds across a sifter, hopefully wearing a protective garment over your hand and, well, sifting. Get all the poop and dirt and other luwak trash, as the farmers call it, out of the beans. Sort through the beans left over so that only the perfect specimens survive. Wash thoroughly with water and allow them to dry in the sun. Modern farmers actually rake the piles into large tracks of beans for a thorough dry. The dry beans are then returned to the sifter for pairing with a hard brush, making sure to peel the outer shell away to get the desired bean within. Any remaining skin is removed, the beans are sorted by hand. Eventually, the Dutch plantation owners got wind of this bootleg java. That is, if not the source, they at least knew the farmers were making their own coffee in secret. Rather than risk being accused of stealing from their oppressors, the Indonesian farmers let them in on secret, teaching the colonizers how to harvest and make a cup of kopi luwak. It was a hit. 
The Dutch liked the flavor, admired the ingenuity, and most importantly noted that the limited supply meant a significant markup in price. What was once a desperate attempt by exploited farmers to maintain some individual income became a gourmet commodity. So, who brought Kopi Luwak into the modern mainstream? National Geographic first wrote about it, albeit briefly, in 1981. Coffee consultant and author Tony Wilde is credited by many, including himself, with bringing it into the popular consciousness in 1991. He read the National Geographic article and it inspired him to import a sample of the product over to the UK. A media blitz ensued, making Kopi Luwak, Tony Wilde, and the firm he worked for, tea company Taylors of Harrogate, famous. Briefly, at the very least. More recent writings about Kopi Luwak credit the 2007 film The Bucket List with revitalizing the clamor for fertilized beans. It's the preferred beverage of the billionaire played by Jack Nicholson. Who wouldn't want to live like billionaire Jack? Whatever happened, the demand for Kopi Luwak increased. Partly for that famously unique flavor and smoothness, partly for the novelty of drinking something made from poop. And like anything big business and mass production gets their hands on, prices have gone up, quality has gone down, and the source has been grossly misused and abused. Remember, the civets are solitary nocturnal creatures. They come out at night and eat and disappear into the night. Most of the time, all you see of them is their poop and going out into the wild, locating and gathering enough droppings from which to harvest enough coffee beans to make even a cup is time-consuming. Even though everyone agrees it's the best way to make a satisfying cup of Kopi Luwak, but big businesses don't have that kind of time to keep up with the demand, and so some plantations have created civet farms. Basically, it's this, civets in cages, with nothing to eat except a bowl full of coffee cherries. On a pure coffee-making level, this has compromised the quality of the product. Civets in the wild are picky farmers filling the bowls for cage civets are not. But what about the actual civets? In 2016, conservationists assessed the living conditions of civets on 16 coffee plantations in Bali. Here's what they found. Civets living in cages that were sometimes too small for them to comfortably move around in. Floors made of wire mesh with no other padding or covering to relieve discomfort. Cages left unclean, forcing the animals to stay in their own urine and feces. Civets kept together or else with their cages stacked against each other. A nightmare for an animal that prefers solitude. Some are kept on a strict diet of coffee cherries, meaning they're not getting nutrients from other foods they'd eat in the wild, such as insects and reptiles. This can lead to malnourishment. If they refuse, they're sometimes force-fed the cherries by farmers. And of course, their cat-like appearance has made them a spectacle for tourists, keeping the nocturnal surrounded by constant noise and activity during the day, stressing them and disrupting their sleep cycle. There have been reports of fur loss, aggressive behavior, and high mortality rates. And it's not like you can just buy from a more ethical brand either. Organizations like the Rainforest Alliance, which works to ensure standards of sustainability in agriculture, refuse to certify any Kopi Luwak, since it's difficult to confirm what's been harvested from wild poop and what's come from caged animals. It doesn't help, of course, that a lot of companies falsely label their products in order to maintain the legend of scat found in the forest. Tony Wilde himself even stated that the coffee companies selling Kopi Luwak grossly and purposely understate the amount they harvest in a year, so as to bolster the coffee's reputation as a rare, hard-to-make novelty. And yet, even by that token, other coffee know-it-alls claim there are more pounds of Kopi Luwak sold than actually made. That is to say, fraud is rampant in the Kopi Luwak trade. The man known for bringing the most unusual cup of coffee such widespread attention that it became the most expensive cup of coffee now calls it, and this is a direct quote from a piece he wrote for The Guardian, a grotesque cancer that constantly mutates into yet more vile and virulent forms. By more vile and virulent forms, we assume he's talking about the variants. Yes, there is a whole variety of coffee harvested from beans either spat or sat on by animals, and in Brazil, a small biodynamic plantation found that its coffee cherry plants were being picked clean with the arrival of the endangered jacu bird. Rather than try to stop them, the owner shifted to picking the coffee beans out of the bird poop and made his own version of Kopi Luwak. They even keep the membrane from peeled beans to make a special tea. In Peru, Uchinari coffee is made using beans collected from the scat left behind by Kawatis, in a process that sounds almost identical to the Kopi Luwak tradition. In Thailand, the Black Ivory Coffee Company operates through an elephant sanctuary. They feed their family of pachyderm coffee cherries mixed in whatever else they enjoy – bananas, tamarind, whatever the individual elephant prefers, finding their source in the droppings left three days later. And as if poop isn't enough, there's also monkey spit coffee in India and Taiwan. Just as it sounds, the harvest comes from the beans spat out by macaws and Reese's monkeys who just want the fruit of the coffee cherry.
So, is it all worth it? Those who swear by the unique coffees acclaim their lack of bitterness. They also praise these natural flavors and aromas brought to the beans by their natural diets of the animals. It's said that a Jaku bird coffee tends to have natural cinnamon notes, and Black Ivory Coffee says their Thai elephant brand may contain chocolate or even leathery flavors. Critics of the coffee say otherwise. Within the realm of international coffee connoisseurs, Kopi Luwak and his ilk are generally sniffed at. Yeah, they may be less bitter, but bitterness is part of coffee's appeal. Whatever flavors they may possess are extremely mild, if not outright bad. And besides all that, it's an extremely prohibitive cost with very little value for your money. Consumers who can afford it are paying $100 a cup for weak sludge and the opportunity to tell their friends that they drink poop. Now go check out why is caviar so expensive or click this other video instead.